She went under the wheels. Welcome to Under the Wheels. I'm Matthew. I'm Gabe. And well, I guess this is actually Under the Wheels Reborn. This is the lazy reboot with like <laughs> half the original cast returning. We went to Canon Films and they gave us, uh, they slashed our budget by a third. Well, actually by two thirds, so we only have a third of our budget. So uh, we had to get rid of one member and all of the production value, which mm -hmm. we already didn't have a lot anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, this is this, this should be good though. This should be good. I was interested in uh, reaching out to you about this because of Martin Scorsese's latest comments, and it's kind of just created like a tidal wave of different ideas that have been floating around in Hollywood. But he's commenting on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we both have different stances on it. Like I actually I enjoy most of the Marvel movies. Go ahead. I, mean, go I ahead. think they're okay for I, the most I mean, part. Yeah, I, I would say that it's it's weird because they've basically taken the comic book serialization and made them into movies at kind of like half speed, where it's like, yeah. Oh yeah, I remember that Scarlet Witch and the Falcon are Avengers. That happened at some movie point. Yeah, That's it's strange that too, because it's, I mean, I, I distinctly remember liking the earlier Marvel movies a lot more than the later ones. And I think it's because they still felt like movies. And then as this franchise got developed, everything that I didn't like about comic books and their kind of endless... The strict adherence to continuity. Yeah, and just the constant plotting around that never results in anything meaningful started getting incorporated more and more and more into the movies. And that that's, I think, at the point where I lost interest entirely. Like, I thought Infinity War... I haven't seen Endgame still. I thought okay. Infinity War was, like, a good ending for me to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, it was a good point for me to walk away. Like, all the... A lot of the characters I don't like are dead. And there's kind of, like, an imaginary world where... A lot of the characters I do like go on to fight Thanos and stuff, but I don't have to see it. It's the whole, oh yeah, everyone loved it when they did a Marvel crossover thing back in X-Men in the 80s, and then Marvel mandated it everywhere, and now it's like, well, that sucks because now I can't really tell an original story. I'm constrained by these requirements that I have to hit this, and I have to hit this, and, and the homogenation, so I, or the homogeneity. So I guess my first question for you would be, when did Marvel movies lose that sense of movie and become sort of the sort of more generic fare or more, more homogenized fare because I think that's the main issue that mm -hmm. a lot of people have with the Marvel movies is that they're kind of like there's a sense of homogeneity that occurred and it didn't start on the first five movies but it did happen at some point where and if you need to I can I can kind of pinpoint the point where I think it kind of lost control now obviously it's a battle of a thousand you know it's a straw that broke the camel's back but for me it was probably right around Age of Ultron where it started feeling like maybe everything is spiraling out of control. I mean, I think you get a sense of that in Avengers when it kind of gets a little bit campy, but that's still kind of campy comic booky fun. Mm -hmm. And then in Avengers Age of Ultron, I really like it, but that's the first time where it feels like maybe there are too many cooks in the kitchen trying to trying to keep this machine working. There's a, there's one other movie that I would point to as well, but but that's where I'm gonna put my stamp on it is Age of Ultron. I mean, yeah, for me, I think Age of Ultron is definitely the point. It's definitely the breaking point for that franchise where the movies on their own don't work as well. Like immediately after that, and, and they had already had a couple duds. They had Thor: The Dark World and Iron Man Three beforehand but yeah actually that's that's interesting especially Thor the Dark World is seen as like the low point I think in everyone's list that's the easy go-to for like this is the shittiest Marvel movie which is weird because Iron Man 3 is so much worse but see you could make the argument that Iron Man 3 is closer to what Scorsese would describe as the cinema of Marvel movies which is again there, I think there's a couple points missing there I don't remember the score particularly well in that movie for one two it just isn't particularly engaging for me which is funny because I really liked Shane Black's other movies but it seems like he's been on a streak of dialing it in for the studio to make money but not necessarily performing well. I mean Shane Black does his Shane Black thing which I think in like the nice guys where he seems to have more control and it seems to be more made for right. him you know it's like it's just a straight up kind of crime parody set during Christmas at some point in the past. He doesn't feel like he has to make the movie for anyone which I yeah. think is the problem with Iron Man 3 is that he did feel like he he did not feel like he had to make the movie for anyone and it kind of <laughs> fails because of that. It's it's just bad. It's a really bad movie. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, I haven't watched it since originally seeing it. And I actually wonder if I would like it better now than I did when I first saw it. I, but I yeah. just, 
But I think Age of Ultron is definitely the point where things really start to go south because then you start seeing a lot more stuff that gets, well, not retconned isn't the right word, but a lot of characters and their worlds and their stories start getting really twisted in order to fit the Infinity Stone gauntlet. Narrative, yeah. Narrative. You're talking about Doctor Strange because that's your low point. Doctor Strange is, yeah, I mean, Doctor Strange is my favorite Marvel superhero and it's one of my least favorite movies that I've ever seen just of any genre and a big part of that is they change so much that's not really improving it or cutting it down to make it make sense for a single movie it's just changing it to fit the whole Thanos build up specifically um, the time stone being in the eye in the eye of Agamora or the eye of whatever it is Agamotto Agamotto <laughs> I mean there's a lot of stuff about that movie that's there's a lot of choices made in that movie that are kind of baffling the fact that all of the action is sort of chain like it, instead of being very spectacular and superhero-y it's all changed to be all the magic in their world is basically either changing the space around them like inception or making little energy whips to slap each other with right right which i feel like is really it's just lazy and unimaginative and was a huge missed opportunity and i mean Benedict Cumberbatch is annoying. Um, <laughs> I like Benedict basic, Cumberbatch, but he just but he's plays not Tony taste. Stark Part Two. Yeah. Whereas Doctor Strange is typically a very serious character. I mean, other characters around him can be silly or colorful or strange, but he himself is very just grim to the point, no nonsense. So it was weird that he's like this snarky little prick, right? Who's like um, making little jabs and Beyonce jokes and things like that. Oh, where they, where yeah. they pass into the the marvel humor type thing and you're like yeah maybe maybe they gave benedict cumberbatch too much creative license in the in the um in the telling of the character i mean again i would say that that's the same issue that i have with guardians of the galaxy where they change a lot of the characters except i guess in the case of guardians of the galaxy it's for the better whereas with doctor strange it's more for the masses they they took shortcuts and they created like hey people liked that tony stark was an asshole and whatever everyone's favorite hollywood's rags yeah. to riches is the ri riches to rags back to metal you know spiritual richness again so definitely it's basically iron man one reskinned as a magician movie not to belabor this point too much but like i think the first ant-man movie gets a lot of flack mm -hmm. for being kind of like oh this is incredibly forgettable <laughs> after re-watching it it's a very sturdy heist film i think they have more fun in ant-man and the wasp with sort of other sorts of fun things but that would be on the range of like what is cinema and what is kind of the theme park ride that scorsese is saying ant-man and the wasp is probably closer to the theme park sort of it's fun to watch just to go into the theater you watch it you relax you know two hours of your life goes by and it's not that bad but it also mm -hmm. ends up especially at the end of the movie it ends up being kind of circumvented by the fact that it has to be tied in with this strong continuity thing most people going to the movie just to see the very end credits you know it's like well the movie would have worked so well on its own as kind of like this fun little ice movie and even the first ant-man wasn't tied to strongly into the marvel continuity that i think mm -hmm. it kind of gets away with it because the the main fun scene is the uh, the easter egg cameo by falcon which i think works really well it's a really fun time but then that you know falls into civil war and then in civil war like oh let's bring in giant man and blah 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 and so i think the mainland the main marvel movies kind of have this uh this sense of theme park mm -hmm. or the the main six the main four characters i guess and so that's kind of what martin scorsese is saying here he says that's not cinema that being marvel movies the closest i can think of them as well made as they are which i agree they are well made with actors doing the best they can under the circumstances is theme parks so basically his idea is he went in to see one he started watching the first couple but they were just so loud and they were so noisy that he couldn't he couldn't stand it. There's a lot of good craft going on in it, but I would think that my closest thing would be this is the equivalent of like a 1940s studio taking over and kind of sucking the artistic integrity out of it. That's where, that's kind of where my basis starts from. I mean, I'm not going to disagree <laughs> with Marty on that. I mean, I think there's one anecdote that I heard that was that's pretty telling of how Marvel works. You know, they're making like a, I guess, a Black Widow spinoff movie. And they had reached out to a bunch of female filmmakers to see if they could stunt cast a woman as a director. And they there was one who was really enthusiastic about the project. I don't remember her name, but I think she's from like the indie film scene. And she came in and she had all these really big, interesting ideas for how to shoot the action sequences because she had a very clear vision for how she wanted it to be. And the producers said, oh, no, we've pre we've already pre-vised all the Every action, action sequences. Scene, yeah. 
we just need you to work with the actors. And she's like, are you kidding me? And they said, uh, yeah, you're just here to work with the actors and, and kind of make sure this project gets done on time. And that's it. And she's like, well, if I don't do, if I can't shoot the action as well as, you know, all the character stuff, then I don't, I'm not interested. And Marvel was just like, okay, bye. Yeah, I think that, and I mean, I <laughs> that sounds like a studio to me. That sounds like, <laughs> like, that sounds like the 1940s studio era. We need you to come in here. We need you to shoot, you know, 18 scenes, make sure you don't mess it up and then be on your way. I mean, I think, you can see that in Captain Marvel, where the character-to-character -character scenes feel completely different than the rest of the action in the movie. Like, I think it's very clear that that's how they go. I know that the second unit, I, I would say allegedly, the second unit tends to take over with most of the action scenes. They use the same visual effects houses for most of the action scenes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I could totally well, see then... that happen. That's fascinating, though. I could totally see that. She goes yeah. in and she's like, I'd like to shoot the action scenes closer to like, you know, handheld style, gritty. And they're like, yeah, no, no, well, you know what? You can, you can wait over there. You know, they want, someone who's, <laughs> exactly. they want someone who's more of like a yes person and not someone who's like got a unique vision. I think that's a fair assessment to make. Go ahead. Oh, I was, yeah, I was going to say, and to that point, I wonder almost how much involvement do the second units have even in any of this? Because if they're, if they're laying out all the action sequences almost before the script is written in previs on a computer somewhere, to what degree? because I know the John Wick guys did second unit for at least one of the Captain America movies, I think. You wonder even how much does the second unit have a say in what gets done or if they're just handed pre-visualized sequence and they say, all right, do this exactly with real people. That's a good question. The second units are probably in the studio more often working with the previs. And I've also heard a lot of stories about how with previs stuff, when it comes to previs in these Marvel movies, I'm guessing it's mainly not the hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes, but it's like the big moments like, uh, like you know, Thanos The airport fighting. fight scene. The airport fight Civil scene, uh, Thanos fighting Hulk, um, the big war scene at the end of both Infinity War and Endgame, um, just to name a few, where they're like, okay, well, these are all the pieces we need. Because I, I'm pretty sure most directors throw out previs. From what I've heard, like very few directors like previs. They'll kind of do it as a well, studio thing. I'm not thing. surprised. I would hate previs if I was any of those people. I would too, except the one previs thing that I think is, is really interesting is, um, what's his name? Uh, the guy who's directing the new Batman movie. When he did Matt Reeves when he did War for the Planet of the Apes. Apparently, he went into the previs studio and sat down and did every single shot previs to make sure that every shot was going to line up properly, since he had to do so much CG work and and motion capture and things like that. Huh. So it, it can work, but I think a lot of directors are averse to it. Kind of like if someone's like, "Okay, you're going to storyboard the whole movie," they're going to be like, "Okay, we'll see what we can do," and then kind of throw out the storyboards. One thing I'll say about the people who have been kind of defending the whole like, oh, I'm disappointed in Marty for thinking that the Marvel movies are theme park attractions and they're not real cinema. I mean, Martin Scorsese makes movies, he made, he made Silence. Like, let's yeah. be honest here. The movies he's talking about as cinema, as like classic cinema, is not really what people want to watch. Yeah, it's depressing, but like, if I had, if I had three hours and I had to watch either Silence or Endgame again. I mean, I've seen Silence. Silence is really depressing. I don't know if I'd ever go back and rewatch Silence. Or here's another example. Your average moviegoer, would they rather watch 12 Years a Slave or Thor? There's a reason why people have Schindler's List in their Netflix queue that they're never gonna watch. And I mean, yeah. going back farther, how many people that are going to watch movies these days are gonna go and watch a French film? You well, know? I think you're, you're touching on, I think, broader cultural and psychological issues that people face as a collective. I think for most people, their mindset is like, I work hard, nine to five, my job, I hate my job, I hate my commute, I want like my time outside of work that I spend with my family or with my friends or by myself, it just has to be pleasurable. It doesn't have to be meaningful. So I think in a world where people's souls are, are crushed by their job, their work, their job and their work life, which is 90, which is most of their life, which is most of any adult's life in America, you're going to take a beer and a sad hand job over, you know, a, <laughs> a challenging but enriching experience. I think in that context, it's it makes total sense why people would prefer the lukewarm cores and sad hand job that is the Avengers over silence, which is not 
fun or pleasurable necessarily, but it is, a, I think it's a it's masterpiece and it is extremely rewarding and enriching. But even like, even going one step further, when Scorsese is talking about, you know, this is cinema, this is not cinema. A big part of it is that I don't, I don't, I'll, I'll say artistic control. I don't want to say directorial control, but I'll say artistic control because I'm, I guess the only person on the Marvel staff who really would take umbrage with those comments would be the guy who's kind of gotten the most attention for these comments, which is James Gunn, because he's made something really creative out of, well, you know, I, full disclosure, I'm not a huge Guardians of the Galaxy fan. Like, I, I watch them. I understand I like why people like them. And I think James Gunn is like a really talented writer. And I think working inside of the system that is the Marvel movies, I think he's done something really unique compared to a lot of the other filmmakers but like but at the end of the day i mean he's able to sort of sneak in his own meta commentary inside of those movies that a lot of the other directors a lot of the other filmmakers are not doing and so i think that was that's one of the things that elevates those movies but it's mm -hmm. kind of like how john ford was making westerns and he got known for making great westerns inside of a system that was turning out a bunch of shitty westerns right it's the same sort like the cream of the crop will rise to the top whereas you know you have a lot of other people who are kind of going in there and they're like hey we need you know we want an easy payday well maybe not an easy payday but it <laughs> feels it feels an awful lot like i'm an indie movie director it, it they all feel like richard marcond on return of the jedi okay you take care of the special effects okay you feel free to re-edit however much you want okay you feel free to reshoot however you want and hire in a new director to do that i'm coming in i'm getting my payday i'm gonna make a movie that will have my name on it and you'll hire me on for the sequels that sounds yeah. good for me so, I think it's a very real concern for independent filmmakers because they're broadly in society and in the microcosm of the film industry, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Right. And that means less money floating around for these indie guys. So I'm not, I think it's a very real thing that if one of them gets the opportunity to sell out for a big Disney movie, they'll do it the one time just for the money so they don't have to worry about money ever again. And then go back to Or the four times making, for the Rousseau brothers. What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Russo brothers were directing Arrested Television, Development, so yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you could call that indie film, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. But it is interesting that the person who's kind of the people who've had kind of the best success have worked in television. Well, like, television think... is a medium where the directors don't have a whole lot of control. Yeah, they're there to execute what the showrunner wants. Yeah, and I think they're there to execute what the showrunner wants. They don't necessarily have total final cut on their movies, and I think like the fact that the Russo brothers did an admirable job on captain america winter soldier and civil war and then got on to do infinity war and Endgame, and they were even able to sort of apply little fun easter egg movie things in there like mm -hmm. uh there's a scene in Endgame, my favorite scene it's a quote one where you know ronan pretty much murders a bunch of yakuza it's like huh, i don't know why that's in this movie but it's in there <laughs> that works for me it's best move best scene in the movie that scene was made for you all the Pretty much, they they were like, oh yeah, we need to we need to make sure we get in all the uh, the Chambara fans out there, all the Yakuza movie fans. It's like, yeah, we they got to be on board with the movie. And to to their credit, yeah, they they uh, they bought me with that one. I was like, yeah. I'm sold. I'll watch this movie three times in theaters. That's fine. That sounded like a good sound investment of my time. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, for all of the people who are like, oh no, the Marvel movies are cinema, I would say look at Creed and look at Black Panther back to back. Just watch them both back to back and you'll see exactly what Scorsese is talking about. Creed has a very specific singular vision and mm -hmm. everything in the movie conforms to that vision in a way that Creed 2 doesn't. Let's be clear, Creed 2 is a studio film, but mm -hmm. Creed 1 is very much Ryan Coogler had an idea, he lined up his idea and he executed it, I would say probably to perfection. I don't think there's anything in the movie really that I don't agree with except maybe the girlfriend subplot, which is kind of just like, we needed to have a romantic B-movie plot. It's not enough that Rocky has cancer. Like, let's throw mm -hmm. in... Let's throw in the girlfriend who's a music who's a musician that's going deaf and like we'll pound home this idea of, of uh, <laughs> Adonis's anger. Deaf. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's hilarious. Good work on all that. Now that paid off dividends in Creed Two. Oh man. <laughs> Creed two was the definition of fine. But Creed one, I would say, is definitely a shiny in chrome. And you've got a lot of things like the one shot let me point it out to you this way, very simply. 
We'll take two shots from Black Panther. We'll take a shot from Black Panther and a shot from Creed. The one shot in Creed where he goes in and fights the one dude, still owns Prodigy's son. He goes in and he fights him in one take. The whole fight is done. He knocks him down. They had to use practical effects to put blood effects in and things like that. All done in one long take. Probably took him, you know, a ton of time to film it, but it looks excellent. It's one of the capstone moments of the movie. Very mm-hmm. iconic, very awesome. The, and there's a lot of meaning behind each component of the shot. The fact that they wanted to show in one long pass his ascension from challenger to contender his own self-confidence in the ring him kind of becoming his person all of that established in one shot that's why it's awesome that's what makes it quote unquote cinema the long shot in black panther the one that's done with like a bunch of really bad wipes where they're in the korean uh the korean casino that looks just like the casino from skyfall oh lord that one that is the that there's a repressed memory there's no reason that should be one shot there's no meaning behind it. There's no structure behind it. It's broken up into a million different pieces. Yeah, it, it's not actually one shot. It's not one shot. It's just made to look like one. They could have had anything else be one shot in the entire movie, but they chose this moment that has nothing to do with anything. There's no resolution to it. It just starts with fighting and it ends midway through fighting. It's a very strange choice. And that's kind of indicative of this is a movie that has the illusion of cinema versus this is a movie that is displaying cinema. And to Black Panther's credit, they have a lot of interesting ideas going through it, but those ideas are muddled by, we need an action scene here. We need a Marvel connection here. We have to have Andy Serkis with a terrible South African accent here. Oh, like the best. It's, it's all, I mean, I, I'll keep listening to him with that South African accent, but you know, <laughs> he got murdered, so there you go. If you needed to draw a dividing line where Scorsese is, what Scorsese is talking about, I would look to Black Panther, just watching two Ryan Coogler films, same guy directing it, co-writer of Black Panther, but could not be farther apart as far as overall quality. And I know that Black Panther won a ton of Academy Awards, you know, I think it won for cinematography, production design, music, like they were like, no, Marvel music is relevant, but <laughs> like... Not that the music in Creed is particularly earwormy, but like it still feels like a studio driven project. It feels like there was a lot of interference by Marvel and by Disney on it. A lot of the VFX shots don't work in a cohesive way. Whereas with Creed, mm-hmm. almost everything builds to a central idea of, you know, you just got to keep fighting. You got to keep fighting and you have to embrace who you are. You have to, even if you don't want to embrace who you were, you have to and you have to overcome and all of these things here. So that's what I think he means by it on a more philosophical level but definitely on like a on just a level of oh they're loud i mean i agree with them it's like watching independence day i don't think anyone will tell you that independence day or 2012 or san andreas those aren't that's not cinema that's they're just loud maybe this is just my me pasting my views onto what or says he said but i think when he's talking about like their theme park rides i think he's more talking about intent you can watch any marvel movie from any era within the last 10 years but especially i think the more recent ones yeah definitely within the last seven or eight yeah you can really see i mean one they exist only to entertain they're purely for pleasure which we've been taught that pleasure is a worthy goal in and of itself i don't think that is a good thing to teach people but that's beside the point so they exist entirely to please but also you can you can really see the artifice and like kind of the gears turning inside of them in terms of how they go about achieving that goal like you watch any marvel movie you can just listen to the dialogue look at the weird out of place story beats that pop up here and there the various connections and all that and it's all very easy to see like this moment is to set up this later payoff this moment is to make you laugh this is to trigger a piece of nostalgia or a reference to another thing you like whereas i think the movies that scorsese makes and the movies that i'm sure he probably enjoys watching or they i'm sure they have their machinery too but it's not out in the open it's hidden a lot more and it feels more organic and i would i would actually agree even more so because the things that are very personal to him you can you can tell yeah like the raging bull because i just watched raging bull recently and that's why i can kind of you know comment on that one or silence you know you can tell it's very personal to him and he even brings that touch to some of the ones that seem more dialed in like i don't know why but the aviator always is always my go-to of like i know he was invested in it but was he really like you know i would agree with you 
you that you can definitely see the machinations of the Marvel machine and a lot of the references, a lot or a lot of the meta references, a lot of the contextualization all happens on a very surface level. Now, sometimes they have interesting ideas. Like I still really like in Age of Ultron, all of the scenes where, well, I guess the one scene where Ultron is talking to Vision about how like they're so, the, you know, the, the humans, they're so pitiful and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, Ultron, you're right. And then Vision kind of gives a half-assed answer of like, yeah, but there's something endearing about them and then blows Ultron away. And you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's funny that that's the entire theme of Hobbs and Shaw as well. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking I'm pretty of, sure that that exact moment happens at I the think end it, of Hobbs and Shaw. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, I because <laughs> another the fact that we both. I, I will seen say, Hobbs and Shaw. I know Hobbs and that, that's a that is a terrible movie. That is yes. That well, I feel like David Leach hasn't really done anything particularly good since. John Wick, like no. I, I, mean, I enjoy it. Blonde is okay, long, but like Deadpool two, it was fine. Yeah. Hobbs and okay. Shaw, it's 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 watchable. I don't even. I couldn't. I had a hard time. I would rather just an entire movie about Black Superman. I'm yeah. Black Superman. Like I would rather just see him in his own self-contained movie, either for good or evil, messing things up. You know, like I would rather just see that because him as a bad guy is really cool. How they take him down is really lame, but they're like oh we have to take him down somehow like <sighs> well the problem with Hobbs and Shaw is it's, you know I talk about you can see the machinery I mean that oh yes like watching that movie feels like I'm sitting in a writer's room just looking at the note cards of the story beats and that that that's it that's what the entire movie feels like it's so obvious everything is so obvious the the purpose of every moment or every line of dialogue is clear as day in terms of the tactical purpose it serves in entertaining you yep. which is like you know it's like a magician explaining a magic trick as they do it it's like well okay i can see all of i can see how all your props work and you haven't even started the trick yet yeah i we're, you know what you're buying when you go in to buy a ticket you hope it's executed at, with at least some form of competency but mm, <laughs> Mm. That's the other thing I've started noticing too with I mean the thing with really big studio movies is you know they're they're not big artistic ambitious think pieces by any stretch of the imagination no, no, no. but like you buy a ticket going in thinking it's like well i'm gonna see it's like hitchcock hitchcock said you know i'm just a guy who builds really good roller coasters and that's what you that's what you buy when you buy a ticket that's what you expect you expect a really good really well-made exciting roller coaster ride but right. studio movies of late are now feeling like half-baked like they're not even well-made roller coasters anymore Which like is... they're the way the cinematography is the acting the dialogue the editing it, it feels like sloppy and last minute almost. I felt that way with Hobbs and Shaw. I felt that way with Aquaman. And I felt that way with Shazam. Like all three of those oh, movies. Really? Yeah, they feel really weirdly... They feel like they're lazily slapped together. Whereas like Iron Man 1 or, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, or the first couple Captain America movies. You know, they're not artistic masterpieces by any means, but in terms of, like, the solid, fundamental, in terms of the fundamentals of how they're put together, they're all really solid. They're really tight. I have no technical complaints with any of those movies, where I, I have a laundry list of technical complaints with Hobbs and Shaw, Shazam, and Aquaman. Yeah, I actually like, uh, I like Shazam and Aquaman. I, I will agree, they have a lot of complaints, but the one thing about both Aquaman and Shazam that I think Hobbs and Shaw does not have is that you could tell in Aquaman and in Shazam, they were like, this might be the only time I get to do this. I am putting everything I've ever wanted to see in this type of movie into the movie. So that's why you get like, we really don't need a giant sea monster, but we're getting one. <laughs> we don't really need, uh, you know, an Indiana Jones style treasure hunt in a movie like this, but we're getting one in Shazam. We don't really need this like really explicit demon boardroom scene that's more mm -hmm. like a horror movie, but we're getting one. So I applaud them for putting all of that in, even if it's to the detriment of the flow of the story, which that's where it feels like, um, so Hobbs and Shaw, the story kind of pedals along. Aquaman, the story feels like it's about five story beats too many. Shazam yeah. feels like there are one or two large set pieces too many. I, there's only so many unique ways you can make Billy Batson say Shazam. And I think mm -hmm. they did every single one of them. And every time you're supposed to be like, this is amazing. And it's like, it's really not. Well, it's what's really frustrating, especially 
about those three movies, less so with Marvel, because they're, they're a little better about this, yeah. is it's like, I'm sick and tired of, one, all of the all of the inserts of characters' faces doing some kind of a reaction <laughs> to then engender that reaction in the audience. Like in Aquaman, when he's fighting Ocean Master, there's all these dramatic push-in inserts on like Willem Dafoe and the mom character right. and a bunch of other people like looking like, whoa! And it's film psychology. 101 essentially right. telling the audience you should be feeling like that right now you should be going whoa this is so cool because look Willem Dafoe thinks it's cool and don't you agree with Willem Dafoe yeah <laughs> So that stuff annoys the fuck out of me because it really cuts up the rhythm of the cuts or it, it throws off the rhythm of the cuts really badly. A well cut together action sequence goes straight to hell because you throw in a bunch of reactionary inserts to try and get the audience to feel a certain way when they should just feel that way already because you did your job well. Right. If the, the flow of the action is going, you should know who's winning or losing or you should be able, like if you're paying attention to the movie, you should know if this is a major thing. There's been well, too much telegraphing be to the audience. Yeah. Yeah, you should be having fun and you should be enjoying it without having to see someone in the movie be like, whoa, this is so cool. Right. And I guess that's the other thing. DC is really bad about this, but Hobbs and Shaw did it a lot as well, where there's a lot of anytime something slightly cool happens, like a character looks straight into the camera and says something like, booyah. And smiles. Aquaman yeah, they have is the, really guilty of that. Justice League is really guilty of that. Where um, they have the, the camera push in as they're saying it just to make sure you know mm -hmm. this is important. Film School yeah. 101. Telegraph the audience. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, that was yeah. the uh, that was when I saw the the first trailer for Justice League. Like after Joss Whedon had had his way with it, I'm sure the Zack Snyder Justice League would have been a dour, boring slog. But it was interesting how much the trailer house emphasized like this is a fun movie. You will have fun and laugh and smile while watching this movie because it's fun. Because when you watch the entire trailer, is shots of the Justice League members smiling, saying like woohoo and booyah and all that shit and not, and not much else and it's like I don't like what the fuck is this what kind of weird universe are we in now where this is what filmmaking is well we're in the universe of filmmaking where they make so few movies that every single movie has to be a guaranteed least common denominator affair to go yeah. to right so you know and granted I don't think a Zack Snyder heavy continuity a bunch of obscure DC comic references movie would be much better than the Justice league we got it would probably have a couple more it would probably be worth going back to to watch some of the fight scenes maybe but fight scenes might be better yeah the fight scenes might be better the the overall look of it like i know a lot of people who don't like the look of batman v superman and i kind of think it looks kind of like a muddled mess but batman's costume actually looked cool if i could you know ever see all of it you know that, <laughs> that, that didn't quite work out in justice league when you could see it all the time and it's like yeah it does look like a bunch of rubber on on ben affleck justice league was I tried watching it alone and I couldn't get through it. Like I, I lasted about 10 minutes before I had to do something else. And then I, the only way I was able to watch the whole thing is I watched it with my brother and the entire time I was just yelling at him about how bad the movie was. <laughs> but he enjoys all, like he watches all that kind of schlock though, right? He's... He, yeah, he, he loves his schlock. Um, um, and I, I don't blame him. See, Justice League is the perfect, like, put it on in the background movie to me because there's so, there are like a handful of points that I'd be like, oh yeah, I want to see this again. But overall, if I'm, you know, if I'm doing something rote or mechanical, it's something to have on in the background, but it has not a lot more value than that. <laughs> Which, you know, blame who you want to on that one. I mean, I, I can kind of see how people are like, oh man, Joss Whedon totally ruined it. At the very least, Joss Whedon made it releasable, uh, whether, you know, for good or ill. Because that's the thing, I don't know if you can't just assume Zach's, the, the Snyder Cut is going, is going to, to be, be so much better. better. Right. Yeah, it'll probably be more coherent. But... There'll, there'll be some, some things here or there that probably, like, probably feel better or work better, like in tone wise Aquaman apparently isn't a giant surfer bro dude hitting on Gal Gadot the whole time I hear that's a change that they made <laughs> but I feel like they also probably there's less Ben Affleck e-ness in it which is you know for good or ill you know we don't, we don't need Ben Affleck commenting on uh, on Lex Luthor's assistant's shoes I guess although I like that I think that stuff's funny oh you, you got really nice shoes yeah all right all right Ben
Here's the other question I have for you. Do you think the idea of cinema is an instinctual thing? Do you think it's kind of like a nebulous thing? If you had to quant if you had to put quantitatively for because you know this is what the Marvel machine is going to do next. Oh no, uh, great you know auteur mass you know masterful filmmaker Martin Scorsese says our movies are theme park attractions. We know that they are, but we need to now appease the art house crowd. What can we do now if we have a laundry list of things? Like, can we list out what makes a movie cinema and can we go through and now check it off for this next phase of Marvel movies? Like, do you think it's an instinctual thing or do you think it's it's more of a quantitative, quantifiable thing. And are there any Marvel movies, aside from the beginning ones, I mean, maybe the switch from film to digital is what did it. I don't think so. I mean, I, th I think it hurt. But do you think there's anything that, do you think it's a quantifiable list? What makes cinema? I, I really, I, it's not quantifiable. I think it's just. Yeah, because I, I, I feel like I think it's it, an instinctual thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an instinctual thing and I think it's also just a question of like if you want to try and develop some sort of criteria I think it would have to be along the lines of like why are you doing this like what are you tr what is the objective of this movie like if the objective is purely to entertain and that's it to to just deliver two hours or so of pleasure and nothing more that's fine I think that would probably fall into the category of not cinema or at least not cinema art. as defined per it's not cinema Martin as Scorsese. art it's cinema as entertainment and that or if the goal is just to make money or to advertise or to sell toys or to sell an ideology to sell anything again that's not really art that's just propaganda or advertising or marketing so i think those are the two those are the two instances where i would confidently say no this is not cinema or it's not art anything beyond that though is really up for debate it's what does it strike you as so here's a follow-up question for you then Let's take a look at Aliens and Terminator 2. Like James mm -hmm. Cameron, do you feel like he has made cinema? And as a follow-up to that, actually, no, we'll just start there. Do you feel that he has made cinema? I have no idea. <laughs> 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 so I guess my follow-up then would be someone like James Gunn, who has got kind of cred from both the critical like oh, film as on. good film. Go ahead. On the... On the James Cameron note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to talk I about mean, this because I could. I, I, I've got a couple. I mean, I could go into this as well. So go ahead. I mean, I can't. I can't. You know, peer into his mind and see what his intentions were. I mean, obviously, what he did it took a very sincere and thoughtful approach, which you don't typically see in a cash grab. I would say that Terminator Two or Terminator and Aliens. You could argue that that's cinema because I think I'm sure James Cameron had a goal beyond trying to make beyond making those just for people to like them or to spend money on them or to sell toys for something you know and he's definitely not pushing any kind of ideology or, or product on you but i mean terminator 2 the, the reason i bring up terminator 2 and alien is because though is because what you said about selling product and selling toys like i look at alien turn into aliens and you look at terminator 2 and those sold a shit ton of toys but that's also there's it's also like you said i think very sincere and thoughtful and so is is it possible to use the idea of like, oh, this is going to be sincere and thoughtful as a jumping off point to get into a movie where all you're going to be doing is selling toys? And selling yeah, merchandise. there's definitely, I think, like a, a hybrid range where, like I said, if marketing something is your only objective, it's not art, but it can be maybe a, you can be part of the, the reason for being, you know? I mean, I think you could say plenty of this, like the Star Wars movies, or at least the very early ones, they definitely have something to say. They definitely have a lot of sincere artistic intent in them in terms of how they kind of play off of like Jungian psychology and uh, the hero's journey and all that stuff and kind of create a more modern, revised version of that. But at the same time, you know, George Lucas threw stuff in there just to sell toys. Like, right. Ewoks are cute, kids will buy Ewok dolls, let's put Ewoks in the movie. Right, let's so add you can do different Starfighters, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, Return of the Jedi is a very thoughtful movie in a lot of ways, but it also <laughs> has its bits of shameless product promotion as well. So you can, you can do both very easily. I think we're just, we're in danger of running into a point where movies are starting to only do 
one of those things. And I mean, I'll also say that I'm no longer in the, well, actually, I was gonna say I'm no longer in the uh, the toy selling range of consumer that they're looking for. But then I, but then there's an argument to be made that they now have these, you know, $125 toys that they need people to buy. So well, not only that, but you, know. if you may eventually be re-entering the market when you have kids. If of you your have own. kids of your own, and then you see it even more brazenly. So that, and that's that's where I was gonna say with uh, James Gunn, like when he approaches Guardians of the Galaxy. Although I would say he probably went in saying, "Hey, I can take a property and give it a unique spin with the first one." But with the second mm -hmm. one, I mean, like, are, as a filmmaker, do you think you can enter into these Marvel products with an idea for a, th a thoughtful exploration or a thoughtful meditation on the product while still making the equivalent of, you know, the a theme park ride? Yeah, you definitely can. I mean, I think Guardians of the Galaxy, both movies, are a perfect example of that. Um, I think like the Captain America movies kind of do that, but they're they don't follow through. Like, yeah, I they think... raise a lot of interesting questions right, that they yeah. never they never discuss outside of, like beyond the opening act or so. Right. But I think the Guardians movies do it very thoroughly and they they carry their ideas all the way through because I mean they they very clearly seem to be about kind of they're like the anti Joker movies. They're about <laughs> I mean, yeah, they really are. They're about people who are cast aside by the world, who really have nothing going on for them, who've been enslaved or abused or traumatized or fucked up in one way or another by society, by parental figures, by all kinds of things, and then manage to sort of heal themselves, find, you know, create kind of a family together and actually help the world instead of trying to burn it all down. And right. both movies are, I think, about that. They're both movies are about the same thing. I think the second one just, you know, the it just takes the conversation further, you know? I would agree with you on that one. I mean, again, I don't, I, I don't really know why they're not really my cup of tea. I just, I don't know what it is. But like the Guardians of the Galaxy movies are universally seen, I guess, by a lot of people as sort of, well, this is the exception to the Marvel rule. They kind of are. I mean, they do, they have a very clear point of view and they very right. clear, clearly say something and they, they deal with troubling subjects matter in a serious way without brushing it under the rug the way Captain America does. And I would also say that uh, Guardians 2, to me, feels like Marvel had a lot less control over than mm -hmm. Guardians 1 because Guardians 1 still had a lot of those cameos where, oh, we have to connect all of these different movies together, whereas Guardians 2 felt very strongly one creative vision, even down to the fight scenes because, you know, the first full fight scene involves these really long shots of, group, of baby group dancing while mm -hmm. the people are fighting in the background. So it's really interesting. Oh, God, I... Ah. I gotta stop using that. It's really interesting. So I agree with you that it is possible. At the same time, Guardians of the Galaxy also has the largest cast of characters outside of the Avengers movies. And there's something to be said about the amount of toys you can sell if the movies yes. are successful in there. So it's- I mean, there's enough characters for an entire uh, McDonald's Happy Meal lineup. <laughs> <laughs> in just one movie. Which is where the Marvel bean counters are like, all right, goal achieved, check mark, we'll green light the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie. All of the people on the internet seem to like it, so we've bought some goodwill for a little bit longer. Which I think brings up an interesting point, because I wonder if James Gunn was given more creative control over Guardians because it might be a more natural fit for selling toys. Like, we have five new action figures we can sell for the price of one movie. This is such a great deal, let's just let James Gunn kind of do whatever he wants. I don't know. It's because the character so, I mean, I guess the from question... Guardians 1 to Guardians 2, I mean, you add two new Guardians characters, but then you also got rid of the entirety of Ronan the Accuser's troops. There's no Nova Force in there, yeah. you know? So... It, I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess the point that, or the the question I'm thinking about is like, if you are, say, an independent filmmaker, or Marvel approaches you to do a movie for them, is there a way that you could somehow negotiate more creative control for yourself and for if you can the sell artists? More toys. If yeah, if you can convince the the suits that well this movie will allow you this movie is actually a really great deal for you because yeah you can sell more toys or you can build like a new disneyland ride or something right. like the the back end sort of non-movie economic benefits are so good compared to 
the other investments that you would normally make that it's worth it to give me some more control. I don't know, but I know if I ever get a Disney pitch meeting, I'm going to be, I, I, Hey, I've got, I've got my, I've got my X-Men pitch meeting planned out. <laughs> the Morlocks. You want to make a movie on the Morlocks? Think about the toys, man. You Mix have... transformers with freaking X-Men. The mystique action figures alone. Figures. Oh, the X-Men? Like oh, yeah. you could have, you could have like a year's worth of, Happy Meal toys. Oh my god! With yeah, the X Men, just... just five new ones every three months, and you're, you're golden. <laughs> That's the real reason Marvel bought Fox back. They're like, you know what? It's not that you're destroying the X Men license because you're you're making too many X Men toys. We need more of that X Men toy money. Yeah, well, it's just like you know, we it's like, hey, you know, there's there's one movie franchise where like a single movie has like thirty characters. <laughs> this, this seems like a huge missed opportunity. <laughs> it's like we tried to do that with Infinity War. It almost worked. It now almost we're going to try worked. and do it with X-Men and Fantastic Four. It's like they sold all the team books to Fox and all the individual characters to Sony. I know. Oh, man. Well, it's... And, and the other thing with Infinity War and stuff is like, you know, there's the market for Corvus Glaive toys is very, very small. Of which one glaze toys? Corvus Glaive, one of uh, Thanos's <laughs> sort of nondescript <laughs> you mean, you forgettable don't henchmen. Figure, you don't want a figure of Proxima Midnight, who has probably my favorite name <laughs> of the whole movie. It's the only, it's the only freaking, because what's his name? That one guy who sounded like, uh, like Dom Hall Gleason on helium. Hello, Master Thanos, you must bend down to. Is that Corvus and Glaive? Or is he the big I, dude? I think Corvus Glaive is the, the one who keeps like fucking up Vision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that Vision is just a total. He's he's a punk in that movie. Yes, yeah. like a he's a he it, just gets beat up constantly. If I had a major problem with these Marvel movies, it's how they start with Vision as like the strongest entity ever, and by the end he's like he's just there. He's you know he's a, he's a MacGuffin. He's become a sexy lamp. Like in the first. <laughs> He comes out and, and hey, okay, two things about Vision here. Okay, so first off, in Age of Ultron, he is so freaking awesome that every movie they have to depower him more and more and more, which mm. sucks. Because they're like, oh, well, what? How, how do you deal with Superman, you know? Yeah. Secondly, I feel like Paul Bettany is one of those actors who can make any line of dialogue sound awesome. As bad as you think it is, if you just put it in Paul Bettany's voice and his cadence, it'll sound better. Just think of the, uh, just think of the scene in Star Wars about the sand, and you'll know I'm right. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Paul Bettany is a rare talent in that he can make any set of words thrown together sound, like, scintillating. It's weird how depowered Vision gets over the course of the series, but it's also uh, Three weird movies! How, like, three movies! Yeah. But it's also weird how if you take Infinity War as, like, this is, this is canon in terms of how powerful all the characters from different movies are in proportion to one another, the most overpowered guy in the Marvel Universe is Wong. <laughs> <laughs> now that's just a great statement but uh but but uh elaborate wong almost single-handedly defeats a few of thanos's lieutenants that are just destroying the rest of the avengers with his like portal trick where he, he builds a portal on a guy's arm and closes it and the, his arm gets cut gets cut off or like builds a portal around a guy's neck and then closes it and his neck gets cut off wong could have single-handedly defeated thanos with that Wong is uh, Wong is like a, lo a Looney Tunes character <laughs> in a he Disney is. movie. It's he like is. I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna put dynamite down your pants, and uh, you're gonna <laughs> die. And for some reason, we're not gonna use this more often, even though it's super effective. Yeah, I mean, Wong is the equivalent of like you know replacing Yosemite Sam's cigar with a stick of dynamite. <laughs> 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 Wong is Bugs Bunny in a world that is trying to get over the Muppets. Just, yes, it, he really is. It's like I, I, that's a good point. Like I never, I never thought about how effective Wong was in those movies. Infinity War is such a strange movie because now you haven't seen Endgame, and the one thing about Endgame that I like is that it is very much about the main six Avengers plus mm -hmm. Rhodey and uh, uh, Karen Gillan and. Um, Paul Rudd like it, it's very much about the main six yeah and Infinity Nebula War and ne Nebula Infinity War is like hey here's a cameo from Captain America or like here's a cameo of Black Widow it just well, it doesn't feel Infinity like Wars, it. here's a cameo of Captain America and then two hours later it's like hey remember Wakanda. Captain America's in this movie 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, hey, we're gonna have Captain America save Vision, and then we're just gonna go away for a while. And um, yeah, that's the. It's about Tony again. It's about Tony and Peter and like all of these characters that I'm like, I don't want to see them. I want to see the main characters. Oh, Hawkeye's not even in this movie. All right, fine. <laughs> Man, he comes back with a vengeance in Endgame. He's like, I, you didn't see me a lot in that one, but I become badass in this one, which is, again, also huh. awesome. Tying it back to yes. Martin Scorsese. Of course. If he was to, like, do you, A, do you think he would ever make a superhero movie? And B, what do you think it would be if he did? Considering that he already kind of has with the amount of, with Joker. The amount of, so I haven't seen Joker, but I know that it's very much, there's a lot of sort of spiritual references to King of Comedy and yeah. Taxi Driver. It's... Well, it's like a, it's like if a college student was given a big budget to remake King of Comedy or Taxi Driver with uh, the Joker as the main character. That's kind of what you get with that movie. It's it's not good by any means. Like, it's okay. <laughs> It's a, it's a decent it's movie, but... I it's... hear the end is really fantastic, though. I heard, like, it's... when Joaquin Phoenix actually becomes the Joker, then those last scenes near the... going into the end of it are, like, those really work well. Sort of. I mean, the, the whole movie's really sloppy. There's a lot of really baffling choices. Uh, it There's is Todd one... Phillips. Well, exactly. Todd Phillips has once again proven that he... Like, this movie is... Uh, He's either it's like, a, it's like a diamond that fell right into his lap, and he, he still managed to find a way to screw it up. He's either like an idiot savant film genius, or he has just sort of stumbled about and gotten lucky that the scripts he works on are just smart enough. I mean, the script for Joker is not that smart. <sighs> like it's... I said, just smart enough to keep him... <laughs> Although he hasn't, he hadn't done anything since Hangover Three, and that was abysmal. Like that's what I mean by he's probably a great pitch guy. Yeah, hey, let me well, pitch I'm sure movie. he is. He definitely has kind of that bro vibe yes. who can like yes. sell you on like, oh, these are this is like the best protein powder. Trust me. Yeah. Like that's the kind of vibe he has. But yeah, Joker is. It's interesting. It's interesting to. It's an interesting movie to pull apart and see all of the ways in which it kind of works. And all of the ways in which it really doesn't work. So, um, do you remember back in like the 2000s when all of the superhero movies that came out were sort of like, they were like above, just okay enough? Like, you would come out with a superhero movie and it's like, oh, this is just, this is okay. Like the first X-Men yeah. movie, you see it and you're like, I'm seeing it because I'm a fan of the X-Men. It's not good, but it's okay. Like, is that where Joker stands? Is it back into this old school like, ah, they did just enough right? Almost. It's like, uh... It's like a, it's like Daredevil, like the Ben Affleck Daredevil. Right, right. Which I still like, has a special place in my heart. <laughs> well, that's the thing. The Ben Affleck Daredevil isn't that bad. I think people unfairly crap on it. It's um, yeah, yeah. It's like it's the it, Age of it, Ultron. It, <laughs> yeah, well, it's like a, there's a lot of things in that movie that work decently well. There's a lot of things in that movie that are weird, but they're still kind of cool. And there's a lot of things in that movie that just straight up are, are dog Don't shit. Don't work. Yep. Yeah. And um, joke is kind of the same way. Interesting. I mean, I've, I've I'm already curious to watch it, but it's also kind of like I'm watching it. I mean, I'm watching it mainly for Joaquin Phoenix. Like, let's that's he's that's all anyone I mean, is watching it for. He's kind of the big bright spot. It's it's interesting because he's not given much to work with from the script or from the direction, but he does a great job with what he has. And he's there's a lot of really really bad dialogue that he has to say, right. but he sells it so well. It's pretty much kind of gone critically the exact way I think it it was gonna go. Joaquin Phoenix is amazing. The rest of the movie is the last King of Scotland. So, <laughs> like, you, you, those movies that come out, like, I, I saw uh, Judy the, yes yesterday, the Judy Garland movie about her last tour in England. And it's, okay. it, it's, it's like, I, I can understand what they mean. Or, like, when you watch Darkest Hour and it's like, oh, this is just two and a half hours of watching Gary Oldman desperately beg for an Academy Award. Yeah. Like, that I remember when la that's why I always go to Last King of Scotland because that's like I've asked people like, hey, is Last King of Scotland good? And they're like, Forrest Whitaker and Last King of Scotland is good. And I'm like, well, that's all I need to know about that movie then. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like Joker is supposed to be that kind of movie where it's like, oh, 
it's well one it's the artistic movie by the guy who did old school kind of like how well, peter ferrelli did green book and it's like oh it's the artistic it's, movie you know more importantly the guy who did hangover 2 and hangover and three. 3 he did hangover 1 as well but let, let's not belabor the point the person who did road trip hangover 2 and hangover 3 doing an art house flick like well it's, it's not an art house flick <laughs> by any means <laughs> If, get, but the we, way that we, we should do is it deserves a separate podcast because there's and, a lot to talk about with yeah it. and it i think it will because i'm gonna i'm planning on seeing it this week so we can definitely talk about it more but going back to your original question do you have I, I have to think about it a little bit more but do you have a character that you think scorsese would do really well i don't know that's a superhero the thing. thing i'm trying to think like what if he could make a superhero movie what would it be what it would be like because i mean the other thing he's he's had obviously different phases of his career where he had kind of the gritty new york death desperate anti-hero or the villain right. is the main character type movies of like Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, right, and uh, Mean Streets. And then he kind of transitioned into more like kind of messing around with more mainstream stuff where he, or like remakes, like he did the, the Cape Fear remake for some reason. <laughs> um, and then he kind of had like the big Bring glossy studio like studio oscar bait stuff with like aviator and i think um you could almost put like shutter island in that category right right the, the departed padded. falls in there do you count and then he Wolf of and Wall then he did in there. uh hugo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just that seemed like a really bizarre one-off like making a kid's movie right. it was really good but like why is scorsese making a kid's movie and now he's doing silence and the irishman which seemed just like huge passion projects well don't for forget him. about wolf of wall street like the no the i mean yeah blip. wolf of wall street is definitely like a big studio oscar bait thing it yeah. feels like even though it's three like three hours long or something right i mean gangs of new york probably falls into that category as well yeah i'd probably throw it in there just because it's 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 still Scorsese, but the, like, not that he shies away from nudity, but there's an awful lot of random nudity in nudity. Gangs of New yeah. York. So it definitely feels That's like true. he's... That was also a low point, too, I think, because he had made, like, throughout the 90s, after Casino, he didn't really have anything going for him. He did he did Age of Innocence before then, but then after Casino, he did, like, Bringing Out the Dead that no one really saw. And so he was kind of on the ropes, and then Gangs of New York came out, and everyone's like, oh, it's a return. It's a return of Daniel Day-Lewis and Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio's in this. And then the aviator kind of set him back on track of, like, oh, yeah, he... Remember, we all love Martin Scorsese. Um, I, I mean, I guess I would go oh, with the Punisher. Oh, all right. Here's what he would do. <laughs> he could make. Uh, okay, yeah. If it's like a more well-known superhero, I would say like Punisher or Daredevil would be a good one for him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I could see him doing like a like like a three hour long or three and a half hour long like epic covering um, like the first two iterations of Grendel or something. So it would have. Like to I think be, that would be a good fit for him. It'd have to be something like Dark Horse or like th that's the thing though is like yeah. a lot of a lot of the comic books i read would not work with scorsese's influence you know like mm -hmm. he doesn't he, i don't know like that's why i would say the punisher just because as a character the punisher is kind of like he he dances between a character who you're supposed to really like and really hate which is what I found mm. the best part of Raging Bull. I was like, oh, he's making a movie about a character that we're not supposed to like. And it's so much yeah. it's so much more interesting to see how he's a self-destructive person. And I mm -hmm. and like you're watching Raging Bull and he can't he just can't help himself. And I, I don't know, I was I was fascinated and I loved Raging Bull. I didn't think I was going to. I thought I was yeah. gonna be like, eh, I don't know. But <laughs> one more one more Scorsese question for you. Okay. Who is his best cinematographer? I'll give you three choices. Know. I'll give you three choices. Yeah. I'll give you four. Okay. So most recently he's worked with uh, Rodrigo Prieto, I believe. Yes, I remember so him. He, who, he, Rodrigo Prieto used to do all of Inaritu's films, and then Inaritu decided he wanted to be Terrence Malick Light and went to Lubeski. So Rod Prieto is his current one. Before then, he worked with Robert Richardson, who's known for, who, who Tarantino then hijacked. And he worked with, oh my God, I can't think of his name now. Oh my gosh. The guy who did uh, Goodfellas and he did um, Passion of the Christ and he did Departed. 
and I can't think of his name, German guy. Uh, uh, Michael Ballhaus. Yes, Michael Ballhaus. And then the last one I'll give you is Michael Chapman, who did Taxi Driver, and he did Raging Bull, and he did, I believe he did um, Mean Streets, and he did a lot of Scorsese's early stuff. Man, I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> really tough. I think, uh, I don't have a good answer to that question. This, this, that's a very you question to ask. It, yeah, it is. It is a very me question to ask. It's like, who's have... your favorite sound mixer from uh, <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola's run in the 70s? Well, obviously, it's got to be Walter Murch, right? Like that's <laughs> Well, of course it's Walter like, Murch. You, you love Walter Murch. I mean, but but also, <laughs> he like he did two of the three films, two of the four films that I... No, <laughs> he did three of them because he did The Conversation, he did Godfather Part Two, and he did Apocalypse Now. So he's probably the best sound mixer that Ford Coppola has ever worked with. Probably. You know what's interesting is for all of the heat that Scorsese's getting, like the, the 1970s film brats are probably the most influential crop of filmmakers ever. And he's the last one. He's the last one, A, making movies, and B, making good ones. I would say he's the last one making good movies because Spielberg is still making movies well, of yeah, I determinant mean, quality. So you got Spielberg who's making movies that, right. are, that exist. Well, and there's not much else mind, to say though, about like, him. Well, um, keep in mind, though, Spielberg is still, maybe because he's got the machinery behind him, but he's mm -hmm. still churning out, you know, he can still turn out one and a half movies a year, which is very impressive. So, so and he's then, still making stuff. Right. Coppola, I think, is doing, like, direct-to-video horror movies now. Um, <laughs> he hit the festival circuit again, yes. George Lucas is, like, eating himself to death, I think. And then Brian De Palma is semi-retired? Uh, is he still alive? He, he actually came out with a movie recently. I think pretty recently he came out with a movie. But, yeah, he's I think he's, he's kind of like Michael Camino, where Michael Camino t could not get a movie funded. Oh, yeah, he did uh, Domino with um, a bunch of Game of Thrones people. Yeah, yeah. So he just came out with a movie, um, De Palma did. But his, mm. I think his skills were dwindling. He was, but he was already on the out and outs back in the 90s. So like Mission Impossible was the last like successful film De Palma had, I think. Because everything else he's done, he's done on like a shoestring budget. And he shouldn't have even done Mission Impossible, you can make an argument for. Like it's well, amazing the, that that Didn't worked. his uh, Black Dahlia adaptation get a pretty That's good... right. That's right. He did well. It did, and he had quite a few stars in that too. Yeah, I forgot about the Black Dahlia. But yeah, it's. I would agree with you that Scorsese is the last cinema god. But I don't think that would have happened without without like the nine or the seven good years of Gangs of New York, Aviator, and then ultimately The Departed, which kind of put him back on the map. Which is like it's funny because The Departed is like the most unScorsese movie you could watch because it's <laughs> it's like it's based off of a different film. It's like he was trying to shoot it in a way that was mimicking infernal affairs it takes place in boston where everyone has these boston accents the only recurring scorsese actor in that is leonardo dicaprio there's no real unknown actors in there there's a bunch of great character actors but no real unknown actors shot on location in boston it's a very strange movie. there's no commentary on it he doesn't really seem to talk about it a lot very few movie references in it there's a and it's his only best picture winner it is his only best picture winner but like ever since then he's been nominated pretty much every movie he's made except silence which i guess tells you how much you should want to make personal projects in Hollywood. I get, oh, it's so sad too because I love Silence. Like you, you posed that question earlier. It's like if you had three hours, would you rather watch Endgame or Silence? I'd rather watch Silence. But I, yeah. I understand that well, that's, that's just me. I mean, I'm a big fan of Endgame and there's something to be said about the pacing of Endgame where it, they, they deconstruct it to feel like three separate movies. But mm -hmm. again, it's Endgame feels like watching a television show and Silence feels like watch Silence feels like reading a novel. And so I like that's kind of the dividing line. Now, would I watch Silence again? Yeah, I'll probably watch Silence again. I never thought I was going to watch 12 Years a Slave a second time and I ended up watching that and <laughs> it's such a it's such a fantastic movie. But like I it's I don't know, it's just it's strange because I'm still really drawn to these Marvel movies partially as fans of the characters, but not really anymore. They've kind of I haven't read a Marvel comic in years and a lot of the material they draw off of is a mixture between modern and past Marvel comics mm -hmm. but every movie... yeah I was gonna say I haven't read a Marvel comic since I was maybe 14 or so 
I mean, other than I did read um, like all of Steve Ditko's Doctor Strange run. Right. You haven't read a new one though. Like my no. my my knowledge of Marvel comics drops off out of in like two thousand and four. Like Dude, my I've... knowledge drops off after like nineteen sixty seven. Well, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say it probably into parts of the seventies, and then like the early eighties stuff is good when they brought in that new crop of like Chris Claremont and Frank Miller and all that stuff before Frank Miller went freaking nuts i don't know yeah i don't know what happened to him he uh, maybe he got whacked on the head too hard or something i don't know i think he like uh, i don't know after after lynn varley divorced him it just was not the same <laughs> i mean it, he wasn't the same before then I, I i think all the blame can be traced back to robert rodriguez which, <laughs> which would be a good topic all of its own like how robert rodriguez both completely changed hollywood and completely destroyed it at the same time <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, that's Robert Rodriguez is a strange cat because, especially considering my most of my familiarity with his work comes from Spy Kids. <laughs> <laughs> that would be I, look. It would be an interesting conversation because you're aware of you're aware of you know Rebel Without a Crew, and I mm-hmm. don't know. You're probably aware at some level of how Alita was different than anything he's ever directed. Sort of. I mean. Alita just felt like Sin City and Spy Kids mashed together awkwardly. <laughs> a little bit. I love it that there's the... Because if you're... Robert Rodriguez is known for his, you know, over-the-top cartoony violence. And, like, to get all of those over-the-top cartoony violence moments in a PG-13 movie was, I think, a uh, I-, I give him kudos for that. Alita has a lot of problems, <laughs> but it is very much a Robert Rodriguez film, which is, yes, which definitely. is you know, for like, better or worse, faces being hacked off, body parts being blown up. Oh, man, I haven't seen Alita in a while, but I will skip through all of the parts that I hate just to watch the parts that I love. You know, I think I could see this is going back to the an earlier conversation on Scorsese. And yeah, yeah. I could see him doing like an like a three hour long epic length big sad superman movie that really yeah. it that does everything that Zack snyder tried to do unsuccessfully with like man of steel where it's like what does it mean to be superman like how do you like how do we know if, like how does superman know he's doing the right thing how does he know he's good at being a superhero like what if he was actually really bad at it right instead of I just what if superman's an asshole that. yeah yeah because all, all those interesting questions that i think he was trying to ask somehow just turned into what if superman was an asshole um <laughs> I think Scorsese could do that really well in sort of the way that, I mean, I'm not sure if it would be very commercially appealing, but he right. could do it in the way that like Raging Bull handles Jake LaMotta or Aviator handles um, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes or the way that Silence handles uh, Andrew the, Garfield the as a, yeah. Like kind of, it, it's really just about, you know, Superman's internal journey through whatever the story is or whatever time frame it takes place. How about, um, okay how about Scorsese doing a Nightwing movie? But it, it's not just Nightwing. It like, well, no, that's more of a Spielberg thing though. I was going to say, cause <laughs> like he, I, I the stuff that I love of Scorsese's is is usually a generational thing. Mm-hmm. And the only character that's really covered the vast generational gaps in DC is like Dick Grayson going from like, you know, being being sort of indoctrinated into this into this dark lifestyle by Bruce Wayne after his parents die. You know, he becomes Robin and everything is gravy and everything is great. And then you see the dark side of, of Bruce Wayne and, you know, there's the parting of the ways. And then Dick Grayson kind of meandering in his life maybe getting in the life of crime a little bit and then finally coming out the other side as Nightwing. And I don't know. I think like the generational <laughs> things are the stuff that I like the best of Scorsese's and like You could definitely fellas. do that. Good Dick Grayson definitely has to have like a humorous voiceover though. <laughs> They just all get my life, I wanted to be a superhero. <laughs> all my life, all I ever wanted to do was entertain people. Just get Ray Liotta to do the voiceover. And he's like, I stopped smoking. And you know what made it easier? These patches and also leaving Bruce Wayne. Like, oh, my God. I was going to say, I'm sure that's one of the reasons you loved Ad Astra. You liked Ad Astra, right? Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I'm going to just touch on this briefly. I'm sure one of the reasons was because of the uh, voiceover by Brad Pitt. You tend to like voiceover in movies. <laughs> I, I do hope you're being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Please, we all know that you, the only reason you love Blade Runner is because of Harrison Ford's 
<laughs> no, yeah, the voiceover in Ad Astra is like the worst part of the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I really, really like Ad Astra a lot. I like almost everything about it. But every time Brad Pitt does a, has a voiceover bit, it was just so grating. Because it's like... We get it. We get it. You don't have to explain it. how you feel to us because it's communicated through literally everything else. Um, however, there are a couple moments in that movie where his voiceover is used to explain something that you wouldn't otherwise know. Right. So it's hard to constantly hate on it the way I normally like to hate on voiceover. Because it's yeah. there are some moments where it is functional. Although you could argue that whatever he's saying could have been shown, it might have just taken longer. Right. Well, the, movie's are, the movie was already long. But I also think they had to have the voiceover in there because they wanted to really sell the connection to Heart of Darkness. Yes. I mean, made. that's... Which was interesting, too. Like, how much they drive the Heart of Darkness or um, Apocalypse Now right. link. Where it's... There are beats of... Or moments in Ad Astra that seem like some bizarre imitation of Martin Sheen on the boat looking through photographs and papers monologuing inside his own head about about kurtz and the war and the journey to go find him and what it all means and that felt really it felt really strange it was a little too on the nose but in terms of Ed Asher is really good it is even though i've spent our our conversation on it complaining um <laughs> No, we should we should we'll, we'll we should talk about it again. I think uh, probably as the year winds down to see if it's still on a list of uh, movies you're high on. So yeah, I mean, I think it's this year's been a weak year for movies so far, at least for me. I think so. Ad Astra maybe in a stronger year might not play so high, but I would say it's probably the second best movie I've seen this year so far. We'll see because uh... uh, Parasite is going to come out in a couple weeks, and The Lighthouse is also going to come out in a couple right. weeks. Right, The Lighthouse there's... comes out in a couple weeks, and if there's any movie that's going to shoot to the top automatically it's, it's probably, probably one of those lighthouse. two <laughs> well lighthouse or parasite because bong joon ho is a genius in the best way which one did, what else did bong joon ho do he did like snowpiercer the host okay. memories of murder all fantastic movies so yeah i'm i'm very excited for this new one um the only other one that i'm what was it oh no um i, I would think that uncut gems would be high on your list but then it's also it's so far out from now even though i guess it's only two months i haven't had time to get excited about it because the other thing is with the safty brothers like i mean get out was the best movie of 2017 do you mean opinion. good time oh yeah Not good. <laughs> good time good time was the best movie of 2017 in my opinion get out was also very good but you know i've seen one of their other movies and it's also a good movie but it's it's nothing amazing. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, they're, they definitely seem to have a, a shtick. So I wonder how much Uncut Gems will stick to or deviate from that. Right. Well, this is Adam Sandler's bid to try and usurp Joaquin Phoenix from the best actor throne. Which is weird because so. you think, you'd think uh, he'd already had his taste of like Oscar consideration with... Uh, Punch Drunk the, Love. The P.T. Anderson movie. Yeah. Uh, Punch Drunk yeah. Love. We'll see. I mean, I... We need to talk about Joker on the next podcast because okay. I also want to get into kind of the conversation around it and how bizarre and kind of perverse the cultural discussion <laughs> is. <laughs> Much ado about Joker. Uh, okay, we'll get into that on the second half. I think there was one more thing I was going to ask you about the Scorsese thing. Um, and I think you've already answered it, but like the fact that Scorsese doesn't watch Marvel movies has given this idea of oh my god because he doesn't do it if we want to be true artists we shouldn't either. I don't think this is going to have any effect in the Marvel in the Marvel machine, but I wonder if you think that there's going to be cuz like it hasn't really placated my opinion of these movies. It's maybe helped cement them in a very specific quadrant. And obviously I can see the sort of artistic or the the sort of cultural merit of these movies. I think it's funny how movies that are all about sort of the interesting character moments in the Marvel movies are more interesting than any of the other moments in Marvel movies is mm -hmm. interesting. As he's like, oh, I don't watch them because... 
I can't stand the action scenes that get in the way of the character moments. But he doesn't even seem to realize that there are some decent character moments, like <laughs> Thor is a Thor is a play on Hamlet, you know. Mm-hmm. Which obviously th- the first Thor movie is my probably my favorite Marvel movie because the it's first got Thor just, movie is criminally underrated. It, it is, is so good. It, but we're both Kenneth Branagh film fans. Like I saw Murder on the Orient Express like twice, and it's <laughs> it's not great, but gosh darn it, if it isn't gosh, Kenneth Branagh turned Branagh. Branagh. up to ten. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that some of his other movies aren't, but like I'm a Kenneth Branagh fan, so I and I, I like Patrick Doyle's score in Thor, so I, I like Thor a lot. And and remember, Thor is the movie that made Chris Hemsworth a star. He was it not did. known until no that first was. Thor movie. Well, the, I don't think Hiddleston. Scorsese's comments will really affect the Marvel movies all that much because it's like you know a lot of great novelists, for example are addicted to amphetamines, but that's done nothing for the amphetamine market. So I don't think him <laughs> shitting on Marvel movies is going to make them less popular. It's, it's not going to make any of his admirers shy away from watching them. Because I think, I think we've reached a point with Marvel's sort of dominance of the film industry and of box offices where the, the, the devoted fans will always be there and they will always show up to watch. The people who hate the Marvel movies and never watch them in the first place are still not going to watch them. And anyone who would ever get burnt out is already burnt out. So I think the supply-demand dynamics of Marvel movies have settled in a comfortable place. I don't think they're going to okay. change much for the, at least in the near future. See, my only counter to that would be, I'm wondering if Marvel has overstepped their hand because Endgame would be a good place for Marvel to take, you know, maybe two to three years, make sure that everything is, you know, going to be okay, mold everything so that it's going to be better and then jump back in. And so I, but if you look at the current slate of movies that they're going to have coming out and the stuff that's on Disney Plus and all this stuff, it's like, I feel like they're about to overreach in a way that they felt like they were going to overreach after Age of Ultron. I thought they might be overreaching. Now it feels like they're really going off the deep end to the point where I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep up with the continuity. I think that is the goal in a sense. I think they want, I don't, I don't know if this is necessarily a good idea from a business standpoint, but I think they instinctively want the Marvel <clears throat> film and TV world to mirror the Marvel comic book world where there's just a mountain of options to pick from. There's all these movies, there's all these TV shows or web series. Some of them have you know really big budgets and are really shiny and glossy and others are more like a CW show where it's just right. uh, like hot garbage for stupid people. Um, <laughs> I actually and, almost wanted to watch their uh, their Crisis on Infinite Earth thing that they're ugh, gonna that they're gonna uh, do. It's that, that just looks so terrible. It looks so terrible. But the but the me from two thousand and four is like this looks so amazing. Of course, I want to see Brandon Ralph as old ass Superman, and yeah, I want to see Tom Welling and come back. And yeah, I mean, I'd be great. I tried Burt to Ward. read Crisis on Infinite Earths back when I enjoyed reading superhero comics, and even that was well, pretty bad. 13 so double-sized issues it... is not really a great starting place for any comic book fan. Well, it wasn't a starting place, but it was just... Yeah, it's... It was annoying, and... and it's... Even it's, now, it's I would read it. It's a slog. It's hard to get through, yeah. I actually like so I Infinite Crisis this... better, Ugh, even though... I, even I though I know want you... to get started on that. <laughs> Infinite Crisis was the breaking... That, like, I, I gave up on superhero comics after, after Infinite, Infinite Crisis. Because <laughs> Infinite Crisis was that bad. Oh, man. Um, oh, but... How it's, Jeff Johns has ruined your world is hilarious Oh, Jeff Johns to me. has ruined comic books for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, man. And I will never forgive him for it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's. I think Marvel wants to have like like a glut of stuff that no one that most people won't see. And I think just kind of the low confidence projects or kind of the more niche projects will be kind of low budget web series. Yeah. And then the bigger, broader more appealing stuff will be you know the the next big summer blockbuster with a major movie star in it like i said i don't know if that's a good idea business wise because i think they're yeah they are really pushing it and they do seem to be overreaching a little bit but it seems to be the direction they're going and they seem to want it to some degree so we'll see how it works out i think it will probably backfire and they will probably end up like the comic book side of things where comic publishers have been hemorrhaging money since the late 90s now right and a lot of these uh, publishers have just gone under 
And I think the same thing will happen to Marvel if they continue on this road. I can see that happening. Um, all right. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up there because my battery is running low. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we have reasons Works for right. when the one, so um, we're going to wrap it up, but before we do, next time I'll intro with this, but um, this time we'll, we'll outro with it. Uh, what have you been watching lately? Nothing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Joker. <laughs> Except for Joker, yeah. I watched Joker, I watched Ed Astra, Mindhunter Season 2. Mindhunter is probably my favorite TV show type thing really? in the world right now. Um, yeah, I love it. I think it's great. It's not flashy or spectacular by any means, but it's just, it's so fascinating huh. to watch. And it's it's just so good. It's, it's a great character-driven TV show that it's exactly how you would want a David Fincher-ish show to be. <laughs> Fair enough. And they've gotten a lot of good talent on it as well. Like uh, Andrew Dominic directed a few episodes of the more recent season. What is Andrew Dominic cool. known for? He, uh, the assassination of Jesse James by the oh, car Robert Ford. Okay, okay, got um, it. And he did Killing Them Softly, which is a really good, really underrated uh, crime movie. Um, like he's he's a guy who makes one movie per decade for gotcha. whatever reason. Okay, all right. Um, but so yeah, he's working on it now. I'm just hoping they get a season three because I know Netflix, their whole thing is the first two seasons of a show bring in a new audience and then every subsequent season doesn't really do much to attract new subscribers. So they <laughs> typically cancel shows after the first two seasons. So I'm hoping Mindhunter sticks around because it's awesome. We'll see. I know that Mindhunters is one of those that like it didn't really premiered at good ratings i think it's kind of it was kind of seen as like a sort of like a half measure a lot of it was mixed a lot of people liked it a lot of people hated it so i'm surprised it got a second season and that was enough to put me off of wanting to add it to my queue just like <laughs> i put house of cards in there because i'm like oh yeah you know this is getting critical acclaim i should watch it adds to queue doesn't watch so that prevented <laughs> me from watching mine hunters but your take on it makes me makes me a little bit more interested in it yeah, well, there's very little in the world of TV that I find interesting because, you know, we talk about right. how Me movies too. have formulas, movies have machinery that kind of, the, the gears that grind and make the thing work. TV shows are just as guilty of that. They're very, they're, stru they're very structured, they're very formulaic, and I would argue a lot of TV shows, even the best ones, are even more guilty of that. They're more formulaic and more predictable than the typical movie is just because right. Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad seem to have set a template that everyone wants to follow now. My big issue with TVs and movies is like with Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad is probably as close as you'll ever get to like a perfect series probably but even that had some they tried to avoid them as much as possible but it had some issues with serialization that all things yeah. have all movies have issues with serialization or all television shows i'm sorry not movies have issues with serialization which puts me off of watching television yeah i would almost rather watch reset to zero type shows than I, I, heavily well my favorite television. shows are kind of reset to zero type shows where it's just every episode stands alone right or even like i think I was going to say even like a show like Twi like I'll be more inclined to watch an anthology show than mm -hmm. like a modern show and try and get yeah. into a modern show just because I know there's going to be so much baggage. The only exception I would say is like if a show has already been completed and someone says, oh, it's good, then I'll be more inclined to watch it. <laughs> what I'll say about Mindhunter is it feels like it's being made up as it goes along in the best way possible. Interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a bunch of writers sat in a room and plotted out like every twist and turn a year ago and now we're just filming it. It feels like everything that happens in that show is a natural product of it's organic. what the characters do and kind of the world that they live in. It feels like a show that creates its own story in a way like it just huh. everything that happens grows naturally out of what happened before in a way that that is kind of unpredictable but feels very right interesting mind hunter off the oh, I'll, I'll add it to the queue <laughs> i'll add it to the queue i've been just trying to catch up on movies i watched ad astra and judy i'm gonna try and see gemini man even though i heard it's been getting horrible reviews there's something about high frame rate that I just have to see. I don't know what it is. I love it and hate it at the same time, and I can't wait. Well, so I have a theory about Gemini Man. Okay. The thing that most people have I have a theory too. High, the thing that most people notice about high frame rate is that it makes CGI look really good. It does. And makes actual people and things look, look really CGI. bad. CGI. Yeah. So I think <laughs> the idea is you got real Will Smith and 
like the CGI Will Smith that doesn't look anything like a young Will Smith. It just looks like <laughs> current Will Smith with his wrinkles erased. <laughs> Like, you have these two characters, and if they did it like Rogue One, you know, the CGI Will Smith would look terrible the way that Princess Leia looked terrible. Right. But if you do high frame rate, where you upgrade the CGI version and downgrade the real life version, suddenly you've you've bridged the uncanny valley, and they both look equally plausible. (laughs) And I think... I think that was the intent of the high frame rate. Maybe. At least giving, giving Ang Lee the benefit of the doubt. I think he's using high frame rate as a technique to merge the CGI Will Smith and the real Will Smith to the point where they you can see him on screen at the same time and be like, okay, I buy that. So I didn't see Billy Billy Long or Billy Wong's... Billy Lin's Long, long Half Time walk. walk. Yep. I heard that if you see it in 120 frames a second, the battle scenes are amazing. Mm. So... The rest of it looks weird, but the battle scenes are amazing. So I think the only reason you can get Ang Lee to do a a generic schlocky Michael Bay meets Jerry Bruckheimer meets Steven Spielberg producing sci-fi movie written by one of the writers of Game of Thrones is because it's an action movie. He gets to film it in high frame rate and push some sort of new technology. Yeah. That's the only reason why I think he took this project on. Now, again, Ang Lee is probably the weirdest filmmaker out there. I mean, I don't. I think we've talked about this before and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. But you look at his filmography and it's just all over the place. Like he's got, yeah. you know, a, about, you know, like he has The Ice Storm, which is this, you know, family drama mix mixed with sense and sensibility, mixed with lust, caution, and based Crouching on a Tiger, prestige kind of award-winning novel. Yeah, like he's he does a lot of that, and then he also does like the Hulk and like Ride with the Devil, and like you know what what what, what he there's no way to pin down exactly and Brokeback Mountain like pin yeah. down Ang Lee and he will find a way to circumvent that. So I'm interested oh, in it. I know it's gotten horrible, well middling reviews, but I'm still. Like I'll 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 watch Clive Owen and anything clearly because I've seen Last Night twice and I've seen I've seen that oh, one last night Last Nights yep with uh, Morgan my brother likes that movie I hey you know what that means it's probably schlock and you know what it is it it's <laughs> it's such a weird movie because like it's so it's just forty seven Ronin done much better than any other 47 Ronin adaptation I've ever watched with like modern action sensibilities and a pretty decent production design and a great villain. And yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that. And I'm I'm trying to work my way through the newest season of Peaky Blinders because production wise, there's very few shows that feel and look as good as Peaky Blinders does to me. Um, and hmm. I like a lot of the actors. So okay, yeah, dude, Stephen Knight. The guy who made a movie about a fish in a video game called Serenity. Oh. <laughs> did, did you see Serenity? I don't Serenity? know how movies like that get funding. No, I mean, I, I've just heard the... It's one of those movies that 30 people who saw it. Yep. But I'm they one were of all them. freaking out about how retarded it is. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I've, I've heard a lot about how it's just completely insane. It's a mess. It's a movie by a guy who clearly doesn't play video games about video games in a way that it doesn't make sense. So yeah, that's... <laughs> well, the, the, it's like the entire movie takes place inside of a video game created by a kid to live out a fantasy of killing a dude. Right, which right? he ultimately does kill the dude and runs away with his mom, who's played so by stupid. Anne Hathaway in the real world and in the video game. Yeah, it, it's... I could talk to you about it later. It's 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 there's all of these weird video game conventiony things in there that are strange. Mm-hmm. But uh, Stephen Knight does have an aptitude for making subjects that I wouldn't normally find interesting and incre- incredibly fascinating. I've never been interested in fishing, and he makes fishing look like a life or death struggle. I had no interest in really? construction and concrete, but the movie Lock makes me fascinated about the minutia of concrete so i give stephen knight credit for that he's he's one of my favorite writers and one of the stranger filmmakers out there all right good for stephen knight yeah good for him (laughs) he's a strange guy strange brit um anything else you wanted to talk about today Uh, not really i think that does it i think that does it for me as well all right well my name is matthew i'm gabe and you've just gone under the wheels reborn